Hi, everybody. Welcome. So nice to see you with us today, um, whether you're watching live or the recording. I'm really thrilled for the presentation um, and the discussion we're going to be having today um, with an incredible uh, panel. Um, and I think that um, I think that you all hopefully will be able to get a lot of your questions answered as well about um, brain surgery and uh, a number of different kinds of um, surgery um, when it comes to the rare genetic epilepsies. So I'm going to do a very quick introduction so we can get um, get started. Uh, if you don't know me, my name is Gabby Conacher. I am <clears throat> the co-founder of Deep Connections. Um, and <clears throat> excuse me, thrilled to um, be with you all today for this discussion. Um, I, um, <clears throat> our partner, uh, one of our Deep Connections partners um, since the very beginning has been Monica Jones and the Pediatric Epilepsy Surgery Foundation. Um, and, you know, Monica brings an incredible amount of knowledge and resources to this discussion um, uh, because her son, Henry, was born um, with um, some malformations that led to many surgeries. So she's going to tell you a little bit about her experience, um, but um, not only as a mother, but also as an advocate um, who was really frustrated with the lack of any research in this space um, or critical information for families and stepped up to the plate to, to form her foundation and bring this information to families. So I'm going to hand it over you, to you, Monica, to tell us a little bit about yourself and your journey, and then um, introduce us also to Dr. Marshley. Sure, I'm happy to. My son Henry was born with a massive unilateral brain malformation. One half of his brain was very large and deformed, which caused him to have seizures since birth. Actually, when I look back in time, he was probably seizing in utero. And so very quickly we learned he would need a procedure known as a hemispherectomy, which is removing or totally disconnecting one half of his brain. So he had this done when uh, he was three months old. Um, he needed a couple of revision surgeries. His condition is a very tough disconnect. But finally at three and a half years old, they actually removed the left half of his brain. His condition was caused by a somatic mutation, a genetic, it's a genetic epilepsy on the mTOR pathway. And I think it's the PIK3CA. Um, somatic mutate as uh, mosaic mutation. And we didn't know this afterwards. Um, and one of the things that I think is really important for parents to understand is that just because your child has a genetic epilepsy, it doesn't mean that they're not a candidate for surgery. So Dr. Marashley, who is the medical director of the pediatric epilepsy surgery program at Johns Hopkins, uh, thought it would be great for us to do a, a short webinar for you to kind of go through what epilepsy surgery is and when you can start thinking about it for your child with epilepsy, with a rare genetic epilepsy. Gabby, do you want me to share my screen? Yeah, why don't you go ahead and do that? Okay. I hope after how many years have we been in the pandemic that I'm doing <laughs> this right? <sighs> I know I always have trouble with this. I have to go down and go to my recent. That's how I always find things. <laughs> yeah, I don't know what's going on here. Is it sharing? Yeah, we see your Canva. Ah, oh, perfect. I don't see the presentation yet. There we go. Now it's up. There we go. All right. Beautiful. So the first message would be just mom to mom, parent to parent. Um, epilepsy surgery is not a last resort. I know often we think about brain surgery as being really the scariest thing you can even imagine for your child. But when you haven't even started to attempt to investigate it, in other words, you're not even going there, you're really not giving yourself enough information to make an informed decision. You don't have to choose epilepsy surgery at the end of the day, but you can start investigating the process early 
going through the right testing to see if your child is a surgical candidate. And for you as a parent of a child with a rare genetic epilepsy, you want to make sure not only that you're at a level four epilepsy center, but that you're also with a center that has substantial experience with epilepsy surgery and experience with rare genetic epilepsies. All level four centers don't have the same amount of experience. So you wanna make sure you do your research to find the right team to treat your child and to go through that testing. What are we talking about when we say epilepsy surgery? I like to put them in four different categories, four different buckets. The first type of surgery, this is very traditional, is surgery where part of the brain is actually removed. So this is what my son had when he was three and a half. Um, they removed part of his brain when he was three months old and then disconnected the rest, the left from the right. And then when he was three and a half, they actually removed the whole left hemisphere of his cerebral cortex. You don't have to remove the whole half. There are other surgeries where you can remove just a little piece or part of a lobe or a quarter of the hemisphere or something like that. But generally these are the more traditional procedures that we would call resections. There are procedures where part of the brain is destroyed. Um, they can do that with a laser. If you think of it like a Star Wars laser, they, they drill a little hole in the, in the head and then they put a very thin filament in and that burns off a piece of brain. Um, they can also do surgeries that disconnect parts of the brain, the white matter, those nerve fiber connections that we have that allow the brain to communicate. You can do that traditionally by opening the skull or now some surgeons are starting to disconnect with laser with very, very small hole, holes in the head. And then finally, this technically isn't epilepsy surgery, but it is starting to be grouped as, as part of the category of epilepsy surgery, which would be surgeries that either stimulate or modulate the brain. You may be familiar with, for example, a VNS implant. Those would be considered um, a surgery to stimulate the brain. And we'll, Dr. Marashley will talk about those at the end of the presentation, because those are the surgeries you look to when resections or destructive surgeries or disconnective surgeries are not possible. Before you make the decision of whether your child should have surgery, you have to get all your cards out on the table, I like to say. You have to know whether your child is even a candidate in the first place. And you can't rely on a recent EEG or an old MRI because that is not enough to be part of a comprehensive surgical evaluation. You wanna make sure that um, your child has a EEG, preferably five days so we can really see where their seizures are coming from an MRI on a strong machine, which is at least three Teslas. Some facilities may use a MEG scanner. Some may see that your child needs additional testing like SPECT or PET, and, and we can uh, God be happy to go through what those are in another um, webinar. And then there are some invasive surgeries like stereo EEG, which is really a way to pinpoint exactly where the seizures are coming from. Dr. Marashley, would you mind starting us off with talking about why EEGs and MRIs alone may not be enough to see if a child is a surgical candidate? Um, yes, of course. Um, let me start my video here. Thanks for giving me the chance to uh, talk with you today. But um, generally speaking, uh, I always explain to my patients that a seizure is an electrical storm in the brain. So basically that baseline electrical activity that all humans have when it gets out of control, it literally becomes a storm and causes all symptoms of seizures. However, the amount of the brain involved in that storm varies greatly between different patients and also between the one seizure and the next. Generally speaking, uh, we will have to have at least six to seven square centimeters of brain cortex involved in that electrical storm for the surface EEG to pick it up. Now, that happens in many cases, but in some cases, the amount of cortex involved that gives uh, symptoms and seizures is much smaller than that, number one. Number two, uh, the depth and the configuration of the part of the brain that is producing the seizure uh, 
Those factors play a big role in how much cortex is involved. Not only that, and how much cortex is actually picked up by the EEG itself. It's a much more complex issue than those three factors that I just mentioned, but it suffices to say that a combination of a small amount of the cerebral cortex being involved, depth of the origin and the propagation of seizures, and then the configuration of the part of the brain involved, all these could be confounding factors, making it hard for regular EEGs, regular EEGs meaning the EEGs that uh, are stickers on the uh, scalp, to, to pick it up. And you can see here, of course, you know, the second line only detects when large group of neurons fire at the same time. That's exactly what I was trying to say. I can continue and talk about the MRIs. Uh, uh, traditionally, we would call normal look at MRIs uh, as you know, normal MRIs. The truth is, just like the slide says, sometimes the part of the brain that is malformed or contains abnormal neurons is too small for the traditional MRIs to pick it up. So finding a normal MRI does not necessarily mean that there isn't no lesion to chase. It means that the MRI either cannot see that lesion because it's too small or again, situated too deep or at a, an anatomical location that is difficult to really discern and study, or indeed the MRI itself looks clean. But that by no means uh, uh, is an indication to not consider surgery. This is one of the biggest misconceptions in the world of epilepsy surgery. Uh, unfortunately, I have heard uh, this over and over, even at scientific uh, meetings where people say, oh, you know, normal MRIs, we're not going to even think about surgery. Uh, we're not going to go there. It's a total falsehood, unfortunately. If you look at the numbers and the research and the literature, there is such a huge gap in the efficacy of any uh, treatment modality that we have for focal refractory epilepsy and surgery, including those patients who have no target on the brain to, to, to chase after. Even those patients, if carefully studied, and as Monica explained at first, are being taken care of by an experienced uh, group, an experienced epilepsy sur sur surgery center, with, we were talking about that specific modalities of testing that by itself increases the chances of uh, success of epilepsy surgery, even if there is no lesion on the brain. And of course, we also have to take into account the fact that age itself plays an important role in our ability to use MRI as a, uh, a testing modality for a couple of reasons. Number one, um, uh, the brain development development itself. So it is very well known that in the first couple of years of life, the brain is immature in that the process that we call myelination, which is the maturation of the white matter, all these uh, fibers that connect different parts of the brain to one another are not mature. They are not very easily distinguished from the gray matter. And therefore, when you do an MRI on a kid, especially in the first couple of years of life, it's hazy. It's hazy because that's how it's supposed to be. And that haziness makes it hard to study that MRI. And sometimes, as a matter of fact, maybe more often than sometimes, things are missed because of the nature of the brain maturity itself. That means two things. Number one, that normal MRIs in the first couple of years of life may translate into abnormal MRIs after that. But more importantly, in my opinion, it doesn't mean that we have to wait for a couple of years for the brain to mature and myelinate. What we need to do is to put together all the information that we know about that one particular patient. Remember, we study the seizures, how they look like. We study the EEG. We study the physical exam. There are other imaging modalities. And even if the first MRI was normal, or called to be normal, you put together all the information that you had from the other tests, and you go back, and then, and that's what we practice here at Hopkins, you go back and look at the MRI again. And I can tell you from my own personal experience, as well as the literature, the chances of picking things up with this methodology, with, the, with this universal approach for the patient. You know, we're not, we're not just looking at a test as an isolated singular test. We're looking at it in the context of the patient. That can uh, reveal things that are not uh, there. Uh, so a second look as a, a universal look is always uh, necessary.
And it sometimes can really get us over that threshold of haziness that young brains have on MRI. I always get really nervous, Dr. Marashali, in a lot of the Facebook groups as a patient advocate, because often parents say, oh, my child is not a candidate for epilepsy surgery. Their MRI is not, they didn't find anything on MRI. And it's really difficult to try to convince a parent that their doctor might be wrong and, mm. you know, they could still be a candidate. They just have to dig a little deeper using different modalities. So thank you so much for clarifying that, clarifying that for our families. Of course. Uh, just quickly, I'll just add here that there really now is a growing body of literature to show that surgery is possible for some genetic epilepsies. And Dr. Marashli was going to walk us through sort of the three situations where, where we should start thinking about epilepsy surgery when it's successful and when it's not. And again, we're just talking about these resections, these surgeries to destroy or remove part of the brain. So genetics is, it's a fascinating and quite complex. Uh, if I should start now, Monica, correct? I'll just go ahead from- Yes, speak yes. On. Yes, it's, it's quite complex. In fact, within neurology and within epilepsy, nowadays we have neurologists who specialize in genetics and epilepsy. So before we go into this, we will attempt to simplify something that is quite complex, yet I think we can simplify it in a way that allows us to understand the, the not the disconnect, but rather the connect between having a genetic problem and the possibility of doing epilepsy surgery. So uh, if we wanna look at the uh, categories or groups of genetic abnormalities or diseases that result in epilepsy as one of their manifestations, we can put them in three groups. The first one is variants in genes related to channelopathy, so uh, ion channels, and I will explain what that means. Uh, the second group is variants of the mTOR pathway. And the third group is basically anything else. So moving on with the presentation, um, what does this mean? What are ion channels? Here's what I, how I think of them. Imagine that the brain is a huge, massive grid of small streets and big streets and highways, and that there are many intersections, many stop signs, and numerous uh, traffic lights. The ion channels are exactly that. They are responsible for the regulation of the flow of all these ions and neurotransmitters between the different parts of the brain, and as a matter of fact, between the different neurons or cells. Keep in mind that there are billions of cells in the brain, and that each cell has millions of branches and connections. So you can imagine how massive that grid is. It requires a lot of coordination. It requires a lot of engineering, which is basically what our genetic material is, to make sure that it works well. If that engineering part is defective or something went wrong, even at a very small level, it can then lead to uh, changes, not only in one small part of that grid, but potentially in all one type of traffic lights. The green light might not work in all traffic lights across the brain. The red light might not work. It might be a little delayed. This is how I think of when I talk about channelopathies or genetic disorders related to ion channels. Uh, why is that important? Because the fact is uh, a lot of patients with SC1A mutations, SC1A1B, and any other mutation that uh, is in, involved in the regulation of the movement of these ions tend to have abnormalities or difficulties with this passage throughout the brain and not only in one specific part of the brain. Now, uh, that is what translates into Dravet syndrome. We know that Dravet syndrome is basically having multiple kinds of seizures that are difficult to treat. And with an EEG that shows you what we call multiple multifocal plug form discharges, it is reflecting a widespread disorder in the brain. 
some of those patients do end up having specific lesions on the brain, most notably the hippocampal sclerosis. So that one specific part of the temporal lobe, the most mesial, the inside part of the temporal lobe is very sensitive to any changes. As a matter of fact, you can have a few seizures and then it becomes sclerotic, meaning it becomes shrunken, small, tough, and it has a different uh, flare signal on MRI. Sometimes those patients have malformation of cortical development, which by the way, they happen in many different situations and not only in ion shellopathies. Still, if we move to the second page, we will see that uh, epilepsy surgery typically, generally speaking, is not as effective in these uh, uh, disorders as we would see in the different the other two categories of uh, genetic mutations. However, uh, if I want to, I want to point out two things. First of all, first of all, the first thing is uh, the first line in the slide. Very small studies. Unfortunately, we are limited in the number of the studies that addressed this particular topic, which is epilepsy surgery in patients with ion channel abnormalities. So there is a bias. We think we know, but we we actually realize that we know a little bit only. This is an area that needs more exploration. That takes me back to the first. Uh, point that Monica made, which is we really need to look deeper. We need to prove to ourselves and to you that this abnormality is throughout that grid before we say, oh, epilepsy is not indicated. Why? Because I'm pretty sure from my own experience and from the literature, take a look at the last line, STXBP1 mutation. That's also an ion channelopathy. It is not the same thing as SCN1A or B, but it is an ion channelopathy. I personally had a patient uh, who had um, that mutation and had very exquisitely focal seizures coming from one specific part of the brain. And at first, I didn't even think that surgery a few years ago was even possible. Looking at the literature, as a matter of fact, it is. And the epilepsy surgery literature on this particular mutation, if I remember at least two, uh, cases where the outcome was good. Good may not mean total seizure freedom, but good in that this patient went from having multiple seizures a day to having many less, fewer seizures a day. So without looking, we cannot really know whether that abnormality is as we would expect across the grid or is it one part of that grid, and then, then that one part could be a target for epilepsy surgery. Moving on to the next slide, uh, that takes us to the next group of abnormalities, which is mTOR pathway variants. So ion channel abnormalities are abnormalities in the passages, in the passage the movement of electrical neurotransmitter and um, ions throughout the brain. The mTOR genes is a group of genes that are responsible for regulating the growth of the neurons. They are responsible for regulating how big the neuron becomes, how it is connected to its neighbors, how it's configured individually and in layers. So it's more of a structural uh, function of these uh, genes as opposed to a, a functional sort of modality comparing it to the first group. And that actually, uh, you see, we said very small studies in the first group, and small studies here. There are actually more studies addressing epilepsy surgery in patients with mTOR related genes abnormalities than ion channels because of that, because there's a higher chance of those patients having hemimegalencephaly, focal cortical dysplasia. Remember, they regulate the growth and the configuration and the structure, not the passage of ions. And therefore, you can see uh, in the literature, uh, up until at least last year, 10 out of 12 patients overall who had one of these mutations that are mTOR pathway uh, mutations had excellent seizure control. A lot of them had lesions. And as a matter of fact, the presence of a lesion on the MRI with a mutation in any of these genes related to the mTOR pathway correctly equals excellent seizure control. I want to bring up to the attention of the group and the, the attendance that one very common uh, neurological disorder, tuberous sclerosis, is an mTOR pathway abnormality. Tuberous sclerosis is much more common than any of these uh, abnormalities we're talking about. It is associated with refractory epilepsy. And many patients are 
good surgical candidates. Uh, tuberous sclerosis is basically abnormal growth of certain clusters of neurons. That's where the word tuber uh, comes from. So they form tubers. They usually are multiple on both sides of the brain. But a lot of times, one or two tubers are actually responsible for most of the seizures in that particular patient and then doing surgery on them. So we have a lot of evidence that, yes, e e even uh, patients with enteropathic abnormalities, the prime example being tuberous sclerosis, are good surgical candidates. Uh, moving on to the next, next group, uh, basically anything else outside of the uh, regulation of that grid or growth. Still very small studies, they're not very common. Uh, they, you can think of them as either microdeletions, the typical fragile X uh, syndrome or mitochondrial disorders. Starting with microdeletions and fragile X, um, they are sort of a combination. So their function is, a, is, is, is not only growth or only regulation. It's more of a combination. However, the message that we conveyed with the previous slide uh, is true for this slide, meaning that if you have a, a micro deletion, not an enteropathway, pathway, not an ion channel, like enteropathway pathway mutations should be really considered very strongly as upper candidates, as opposed to ion channels, if you have a lesion and either micro deletion, fragile X, the literature tells us that the chances of seizure freedom and good seizure control are high. I think the only thing that stands out is mitochondrial disorders. That is because mitochondria, just like these ion channels that are found throughout the brain, mitochondria are basically the small factors within the cells that produce energy that moves uh, the cells that basically in order for you to really have electricity and move around, you need to produce energy. It, mitochondrial disorders typically affect all cells of the brain. So we have the same problem that we have with the ion channel prop, uh, group, which is it's a diffuse disorder. That's why patients with mitochondrial diseases, even if there is a, a, you know, hypocampal sclerosis, for example, a focal lesion may not become uh, seizure-free or respond as well as uh, the other groups. But again, I do want to highlight two things. Number one, this is a, a growing field. We still know little, much more research is needed. And number two, in order to achieve this first goal, doing that comprehensive epilepsy evaluation is key. Saying that, okay, the whole exome sequencing or the gene panel, the epilepsy gene panel showed this, there is a genetic problem. And therefore, we're not gonna even go and do another MRI or another EEG uh, admission to the epilepsy monitoring or a PET scan or a SPECT, et cetera, et cetera. We are losing data by not looking. And I always say to myself and to families and colleagues, you will never know until you look. We always have to keep in mind that a comprehensive epilepsy workup is something that families and patients with refractory epilepsy are very familiar with. It is just an upgrade. Sometimes it's a massive upgrade, but it's an upgrade to test that you know what they are. You know what an EEG is. You know what an MRI is. A PET scan is a machine that may not look very different than an MRI machine. The same thing goes for a SPECT scan. Uh, neuropsychology testing is basically, none of these tests are envisioned. That does not commit to surgery, but it might open massive doors towards solutions, surgical or not. Therefore, the message that I always tell any patient with refractory epilepsy, focal or not focal, is allow us to look, allow us to utilize the tests that we are very familiar with that have literally almost a zero chance of harming because you know, compared to a big seizure, a massive seizure happening at home, a seizure happening in the epilepsy monitoring unit where you have doctors and nurses and support staff is much less likely to be harmful, in my honest opinion. If you do all that test, testing, you will know. You will gather, you will become knowledgeable. Knowledge is power. Then you will know if this is something epilepsy is indicated or not. And anyway, I'm, I'm belaboring over this. So we, we can keep no, going. No, it's a great point. It's a, it's important. You, you have to have all the testing done in order to have all the information you need to make a decision. You can't just stop at the MRI looks good. For sure. Exactly. Exactly. Yeah. Thank you. Um, 
And that's what I have to, uh, to say about uh, the rare genetic disorders. I just wanted to throw in this slide about a lot of those papers that we were reviewing in order to prepare this presentation talked about seizure freedom as being the ultimate goal. But I know for many of our in our community, seizure freedom is not possible, but substantial seizure reduction may be just enough to give your child a better quality of life. So when you're exploring these surgeries, keep your mind open to the possibility that the procedures may not stop all the seizures completely, but they may re reduce that seizure burden enough so for example, maybe now your child can hold up their head if, they're, if they have multiple severe impairments, maybe they can now hold up their head so they can start taking food by mouth. If for a child who has um, less physical challenges, maybe now they can have the attention that they need to start learning in school. We need to keep an open mind about what our end goals are as parents when we're looking at these procedures. Dr. Marashla, could you also talk about for those whose children, you know, ultimately are not candidates for some type of resection, about the neuromodulation devices that are now available? Definitely. So um, neuromodulation is uh, not exactly the concept of it is not exactly new, but it is uh, a lot of its components are new, and it is gaining momentum. And um, at the end of this week, the American Apple Society meeting will start, and many. Uh, panels and special interest groups and lectures will be talking about neurostimulation or neuromodulation. Um, uh, it has three different uh, modalities as of now. As you can see in front of you, we have what we call RNS, which is responsive neurostimulation. The basis of neurostimulation is that if seizures are arising from one area in the brain, that is too important for the functionality of the patient. Say, for example, the language area or the dominant hand movement area or the memory area. Uh, because applied surgery is always a balance between controlling seizures and what could, what deficits that could happen if you perform surgery. So if we determine that surgery cannot be performed on that part of the brain because it is too important functionally for the patient, that is when you think very strongly about neurostimulation. Neuro responsive neurostimulation, or RNS, uh, is designed to stimulate through complex mechanisms and parameters, stimulate that very specific area of the brain or the general region of the brain where we think seizures are coming from. An example would be, okay, well, it's the dominant uh, hippocampus in someone who has very good memory that's causing seizures. If you do surgery on the dominant hippocampus in that patient, they will take a hit, hit to their verbal memory and their quality of life may not be as good. Uh, as a matter of fact, it will not be as good as it is when, with their memory uh, preserved. If you know it's the hippocampus itself, RNS using either a strip like the picture in front of us or a special stereo uh, electrode, you target the exact hippocampus and RNS can not only stimulate, but it actually detects seizures. So as we are recording, we learn what uh, pattern the seizure will have on RNS, and then we program the computer, the little computer, which is a, a small metal plate that you can see it here in the picture that's inserted in the skull. We teach or program that computer to detect the seizure pattern and actually stimulate in response, and then basically fight fire with fire, if you will. Sometimes we are unable to know exactly where it's coming from, but we know the general region. So say, for example, the temporal lobe. We're not quite sure if it's the hippocampus or other parts of the temporal lobe. Studies have shown that you can stimulate any part of that temporal lobe in the vicinity of where you think seizures are coming from, and you can still have good results. So that is the essence of neurostimulation. Two things. If the location of the cerebral cortex is too important for the patient, we know exactly where it's coming from, but we can't take it out you place the stimulation uh, strip or electrode in it. If you know the general region, but you can't really put your hands on it, and you can't just go ahead and take an entire lobe, you can still do neurostimulation. The second modality of uh, RNS, the second modality of neurostimulation, which is um, VNS, uh, I think that's uh, the next slide. That is actually the oldest neurostimulation modality that we have. 
DNS is vagus nerve stimulation. So the target with RNS is the cortex. The target with VNS is the vagus nerve, which is a nerve that has special connections. They're quite complex, but they have special connections. It has special connections to some subcortical centers that then connect to the cortex. The idea that phonic stimulation, so you can see the battery that's inserted uh, in the chest underneath the skin, of course, is very thin these days. You can hardly feel it, even if you know the VNS is there, if you touch it. So it's very, cosmetically, it's pretty acceptable, but it connects to the vagus nerve and it stimulates. Um, uh, there are uh, new improvements with VNS where the VNS is actually capable of detecting heart rate. And if the heart rate rhythm is compatible with the heart rate rhythm that you see with a seizure, it kicks in, just like RNS. So it's sort of a, a lower level RNS, but it simulates the vagus nerve. And the theory is that over months, sometimes years, it can calm seizures down by changing the neurotransmitter environment in these uh, subcortical nuclei connected to the vagus nerve and subsequently upstream it, it regulates the cortex of the brain then uh, regulates seizures because you have to remember seizures do come from the cortex of the brain not from elsewhere. Um, VNS I think of it as an adjunctive therapy. I don't think of it as something that can necessarily produce seizure freedom but it is a day procedure. It is easy to manage. The complications are um, rare and the side effects are pretty much manageable. So it's it's a pretty benign uh, uh, stimulation modality. The next stimulation modality is DBS or deep brain stimulation. And this kind of sits between RNS and VNS. So RNS, you put the electrodes that produce the electrical stimulation in the cortex itself. VNS, you attach them to a nerve in the neck that is connected through multiple pathways to the cortex. DBS, the target with DBS is the thalamus. The thalamus, think of it as central station. It is the part of the brain, not the cortex, it's underneath the cortex is deep, but it's that part that has uh, multiple different uh, nuclei, we call them, but it's connected to the entire cortex. So it has very dense connections to the cortex. And the idea, just like VNS, that if you stimulate certain parts of the thalamus, over time, because it has that special connection to the cortex, it can regulate upstream and then calm the cortex down over time. Uh, uh, with the, with the, the, I may have uh, forgotten to mention that, so we talked about indication with RNS, which is we know exactly where it's coming from, but we can't do surgery on. With VNS and DBS, um, the indications is or are basically we don't know necessarily where seizure might be coming from, either that or they are coming from multiple parts of the brain where you cannot possibly do surgery on the left and the right, front and back at the same time. Or uh, it has been and it's being used and there's more and more data on its use with generalized epilepsy. So we, we used to think that epilepsy is something that works only for focal epilepsy. As a matter of fact, with the advent of especially DBS, uh, simulating the thalamus, that opened a big door towards a whole cohort of patients who were never thought of as surgical candidates. But now, even though they have generalized epilepsy, which means that that electrical storm affects the entire cortex at the same time, even with that very challenging situation, you can't pinpoint where it's coming from, you have that hub, you have that thalamus that you can stimulate. And over time, it opens, and as a matter of fact, the research shows us that it regulates the exact rates of seizure freedom, but we do know that over five to seven years, at least, that there is some decrease in the number of seizures. Uh, as a matter of fact, better even than uh, available medications out there. So these are the three modalities of neurostimulation that we have so far. And many, many, you know, much progress is done. And I, I'm very excited to go to AES this year and see what, what people have to say, because we, I personally, in my practice, have a lot of patients who 
never were thought to be surgical candidates before, but I think this opens a big window to them. Yeah. Dr. Marashli, thank you so much. You are a tireless advocate for this community. We appreciate you very much. Thank you for giving me the chance to speak today. Gabi, do you want to take the questions or? Yeah, so uh, first of all, I want to thank you both because this, um, that was a really excellent overview. And I think I've stated in the beginning, this is definitely just an overview. There's so much more to talk about and know about and so much more deeper that we can go into each of these options. Um, we do have another webinar we did with um, Sandy Lamb um, uh, on digging really into the stimulators a little bit more. Um, so that is available and it's a great conversation. But I think it's clear that um, this is something we should be talking more about. And um, and I'm thrilled to hear that um, it's coming up more as an option for families because it's, you know, my in my work, I approach everything from a very much for human rights based, like uh, thinking of things. And every option should be put on the table for every family to make an informed decision about. And I'm grateful that we have Monica and others who are doing the education and the outreach on this and supporting families in this process, because um, there's no reason that we shouldn't be told about this. I certainly wasn't. And I think, you know, even at these, you know, very top institutions, it's not something that's being talked about enough. So this kind of advocacy is going to help. And I think having families know that they can say, I want to put this on the table, let's talk about it. And <clears throat> I think it's incredible to think about it as a fact-finding mission, right? Like, let's just see, let's do these additional tests. Let's look, let's get a better view because a lot of the tests we do are so cursory and we see just a little and then big decisions are made based on that. But why not find out more and learn more if we can? So um, I'm really grateful for the dis this discussion. Um, and I also loved your um, analogy, Dr. Uh, Marshley, about the, you know, the roads and the, you know, the <laughs> with the stoplights and all that. It's a great way of thinking about the ion channels. So um, we did have a question that came in. Um, and the idea is basically that, uh, you know, if a child has a degenerative disorder or a disease, excuse me, form of epilepsy, um, and they're having intermittent seizures, not super frequently, right? Um, but basically they had like two episodes over the last two years that are, are very <clears throat> difficult, you know, is that still somebody who's a good candidate for at least assessing for brain surgery? You know, a lot of, you know, this parent says that they mostly hear about, you know, kids who have surgery or kids who are having just seizure after seizure. It's just a barrage of seizures. But is that also um, someone who might be a good candidate for a surgical uh, evaluation? I would say yes, definitely. Um, I'll start with this. One seizure is one seizure too many, first of all. Secondly, uh, the definition of refractory epilepsy is not attached to a certain frequency of seizures. In other words, or the definition of a surgical candidate. So in other words, you do not have to have daily seizures or weekly seizures or monthly seizures. The truth is a seizure of six months or a seizure a year still carries an impact on that particular patient. Now, if it's a small myoclonic jerk that happened one morning is one thing, but if it's a big seizure or a focal seizure or a prolonged seizure, convulsive seizure, then most definitely, if that patient had tried two or more medications and did not respond and is still having yearly seizures, most definitely that is indicated. Because I want, I want to imagine two scenarios, one seizure a year with two, three, four medications versus no seizures on one medicine or sometimes no medications at all. And what comes out of that? Doctor visits, tests, ER visits, uncertainty about going to school, uncertainty about driving, and, and the list goes on. So the truth is um, we don't call epilepsy a seizure disorder anymore because it's not only seizures. Seizures are one part of that. It, it's the social stigma, it's the financial burden, it is the doctor visit, it is the, so many, many things. Therefore, to answer your question, sorry for the long answer, refractory epilepsy, plus ongoing seizures, regardless of the frequency, 
an evaluation, at least an evaluation is more definitely needed. I'd like to answer that question as well. I know the parent had mentioned that the child had Sturge Weber syndrome and a hemispherotomy had been suggested, which is the scariest of all the epilepsy surgeries. I remember when the, sur the neonatologist said, well, there's this procedure where they can take out half your baby's brain. I, I thought he was nuts. It, it was, I didn't even know you could do that. And I thought all children afterwards were, you know, comatose or something like that, barely alive. Um, I know that the research says that the shorter, most of it, not all of it, most of it says the shorter time seizing prior to surgery generally results in better outcomes. When it's something that's degenerative, like Sturge Weber syndrome, it's not going to get better. Mm -hmm. You're just sort of putting off what the Sturge Weber is probably going to already do, as well as disrupt the good hemisphere with the seizures that you can see. I, I would want to know if there's subclinical activity that your child is having. It's mm -hmm. critical to make sure that you're with a team that has substantial experience with hemispherectomy or hemispherotomy. Some teams don't do a lot of them. They may do one or two and we, we don't have that data at our fingertips so you need to ask when was the last time you performed a hemispherectomy how many hemispherectomies do you perform every year and how long have you been doing them at this facility and you will learn very quickly who you should keep talking to and who you really should move away from and really this is with all these surgeries you know not everybody does rns right now mm -hmm. the more experienced teams are the ones that are allowed to use rns off label because it's not approved for children yet so if your facility doesn't have rns then it means that the surgeon I, i'm going to stick my neck out a little a bit here either they don't have it yet because they're almost about to get it or they don't have the experience yet, the expertise to be able to use it because that's what off-label means. It means someone with expertise can use it. So you, you really have to ask some really difficult questions. We have a lot of them on, on our website. We also have peer supporters who are trained and certified that you can talk to about this journey because it's not something we take lightly. This is not a tonsillectomy. We're talking about really big procedures here and we're here for you. Yeah, no, I think it's so important to raise the the kinds of that we have to be informed consumers of when we're search, you know, seeking this kind of a very intensive, you know, um, intervention, right? And it's, uh, I love how you advocate that it's not it's not an end of the road kind of last resort, but it's one you want to be thoughtful about and you want to make sure you're asking the right questions. And I know from sitting in lots of different meetings that, um, and this is also maybe a little controversial to talk about, but the reality is, is that hospitals are looking for revenue. Brain surgeries bring in a lot of revenue because uh, it's a major surgery. And you can tell me if I'm wrong, but what I've heard is that a lot of places don't like to refer out because it's the kind of procedure that the hospital needs to bring in revenue. That being said, I'm not saying that doctors are doing things irresponsibly or making recommendations irresponsibly in that sense, but it's 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 important for us to be informed and ask the right questions and feel free to say I want to speak you know have a second opinion. I'm interested in you know um, and and finding out what what their really qualifications there are for, um, at that site. Yep. I also want to add that you know. Uh, Besides the experience, uh, and I totally agree with that, um, the epilepsy surgery, so the counterpart or the other end of uh, uh, hospitals wanting to do epilepsy surgery is them not wanting to tackle on or take on the more complex cases. And when I say that, uh, if we want to look at private practice, for example, or smaller, regardless of the kind of the practice really, if we want to take a look at many hospitals that may not be as experienced or as dedicated or have all the components of an epilepsy surgery program, you will see that they will take on clear, obvious cases and they will prefer or not take on the more complex, the non-lesional, for example. Mm -hmm. Or, uh, you know, neurostimulation is great, 
but uh, there has been a wave that is, oh, well, we're gonna neurostimulate everyone. Because if you do a VNS or a DBS, you eliminate the need to think carefully and try to come down to a surgical, traditional surgical solution. Mm -hmm. The way I approach it is that workup needs to be equal to all patients, whether we, from the first moment, think they are excellent surgical candidates or they are poor surgical candidates. Because this qualification changes as you are doing the workup. And as you are doing the workup and digging deep, and doing invasive EEG, stereo EEG, or depth and grids if needed, you're gaining more information. It is after all this has not been useful in telling us this is where seizures are coming from, and then therefore we can do resection, disconnection, or laser ablation, that you move to neuromodulation. Sometimes it's a combination of both. But I have seen a wave of people just, okay, let's do more VNS or DBS or ARM. Yeah, that's why you, you really not only need to look at the um, experience, but you also want to have that feeling that all testing has been done and thoroughly reviewed and talked about in details before you conclude, okay, now we have one, two, three, four options, or we have only one option. Does that make sense? Yes, mm -hmm. absolutely. Um, uh, I had a couple of questions that came in before um, the session. One of them was, how can you find the right center? Have we talked a little bit about this, but Monica, do you guys have resources on your website about sites that do surgery or um, is there a good way to get information? Yeah. So there, the National Associ Association of Epilepsy Centers has um, the designations of level three or level four epilepsy center, which I will say just because you're at a level four center, it does not mean that's enough. You need to, yes. you need to dig deeper. Um, you want to know, so we have a whole list of questions you ask the team. You want to know where the surgeon trained. Are they an adult neuro neurosurgeon that's just starting to dabble in pediatrics? That's not something that you want. Are they a fellowship trained epilepsy surgeon? How long has the facility been performing epilepsy surgery? Just because a facility says, hey, we're a level four now, we can do this, doesn't mean they should be doing it. Mm -hmm. And do they have all the weapons available for your child? This is a battle at the end of the day. We're fighting for our kids to get the right treatment. There's medical weapons you can use, drugs. There are surgical weapons you can use. You wanna make sure the team has available to them all the weapons. And then we have to figure out what's the best weapon that we can use for your child. For my kid, he needed a cluster bomb. We had to take out the whole half a hemisphere. Mm -hmm. For your child, you might just need a tiny little zap with a laser, you know, but you don't even know that until you have the right evaluation with the right team. Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, I think that's so important. Um, can we talk a little bit about what recovery looks like? Um, you know, I had one person write in and said, what do things look like after? Uh, I'm sure it's not, it, it varies a lot, but, you know, can you tell us a little bit about that and, and maybe also weigh in on how your peer, um, how your peer advocates, um, counseling advocates really help families through this? Sure. Recovery is going to depend on a multiple factors. It's going to depend on how your child was doing preoperatively. Um, the length of the surgery, whether they require an open surgery, meaning they have to actually open up the skull, or whether they can do the surgery through a little hole in the skull. Um, it's going to depend on whether or not you have complications during surgery, which are generally quite, quite rare, but you might get meningitis or something like that, which is going to mean a longer hospital stay. Uh, my son, for example, his third brain surgery to actually <clears throat> remove half of his brain it was a 14 hour procedure. He walked into the hospital and we brought him home a month later, barely able to hold up his head and tube fed. That didn't last forever though. Within three months, he was walking, he was eating hamburgers. For some kids, it's a slower recovery, but for that hope of seizure freedom, which we do have, um, when people ask me, how is your son doing? I always say he's doing a thousand times better than he would have been had we not done this surgery. 
um, that's really the answer that you're looking for is, are they better? Um, they may not be quote unquote normal. Uh, my son lost again, again, he had the most drastic procedure that you could have. He lost half his vision. He does not have fine motor use of one hand, but he's a thousand times better than he would have been. I don't think he would have been alive today if we hadn't really tried to find um, the best procedure for him. For me, I've always thought of this sort of like cancer. If the mm -hmm. cancer is starting in a certain part of the brain, can you imagine if a team only gave you medicine for the cancer and never said, maybe we should try brain surgery to get the cancer out? It's easy for us to wrap our heads around brain surgery for cancer. We have to shift that, shift that mindset over to brain surgery for epilepsy as well. So we've always thought of his malformation like a cancer. It had to come out. It's a great analogy. I totally agree with it. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And uh, maybe to talk on that a little bit more, you know, obviously um, with a cancer, the, the problem is that the worry is that it would spread and metastasize and grow and grow and grow. What does happen if somebody continues to have seizures, you know, we, I think we get this question a lot about like, you know, we know we have this saying time is brain, right? If you, and you know, seizures continue to happen, there will, there could very possibly be damage to the brain. So what's happening if there's continual seizures, um, that, you know, are happening, and you kind of got at this a little bit in the beginning too, um, Dr. Marashley, but maybe you can share a little yeah. bit on that. I think two things, uh, do happen with that. Number one, um, there are different complex processes through which uh, initially normal parts of the brain might be influenced and become more, what we call, epileptogenic over time, meaning that it is sim sim similar to an infection. It starts somewhere or a cancer and spreads somewhere else, and then those cells get infected. It's not that they get infected with epilepsy, but if that that electrical activity is always dysregulated in one part of the brain, the brain is one big network. It's not isolated from different parts are not isolated from uh, one another. Different, there are certain parts that are connected with one another actually much more strongly than uh, other parts, but they, it's one big network. And because, for example, the hippocampus is strongly connected to the insula, to the anterior cingulate, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, yes, uh, and to the other hippocampus, you can start having seizures on one side, and then if years go on, and we don't have exactly an exact number or a cutoff because it's much more complex than that, after a certain amount of time, yes, other parts of the brain start responding and not singing, but producing this noise on their own. So doing stopping seizures early on uh, would, we call it, it is a disease modifying uh, procedure because it can stop that process from happening. The other thing that happens with ongoing seizures is that uh, parts of the brain that are not involved in producing seizures become tired. They are working overtime or they are not, they are always under the influence of noise. They are, if you go into sleep, you want to recuperate and actually sleep. But if electrical activity is happening during sleep, for example, or you had a lot of seizures during the day, you're not going to rest well. The rest of the brain is not going to recuperate. And therefore, even though it's only one spot causing seizures, everything else looks fine on EEG and MRI. The truth is it can still be annoyed, just like one very noisy, annoying neighbor <laughs> can make the whole neighborhood pretty irritated, even though they are not producing the noise themselves. So those are the two, the two downstream effects, I think, of ongoing seizures. Uh, other parts of the brain becoming seizure producing parts themselves or getting so tired and influenced negatively that they cannot carry on with their functionality. That's why a lot of patients who have many seizures or uncontrolled epilepsy, over time, you'll see they become sleepier, even though they're getting enough sleep. They become, they have memory problems. They have, they are a little behind when it comes to cognition mm -hmm. and uh, development compared to their peers who do not have, because of those reasons. So stop, that's why stopping seizures if it's something or reducing them, if it's something that's possible, should be pursued, definitely. I can tell you what happened quickly to my son. I know we're at 1 p.m. 
in between his second and third epilepsy surgery, I could not stomach a third surgery. I thought, my God, what are we doing? Another big surgery. And in that year and a half, he -hmm. lost every single spoken word and has never spoken again. So because I was afraid he lost everything. And I, it's one of the things I regret most is that my fear, you know, we, we, we lived with those seizures that took away all of his spoken words. I've never heard him say mama ever since. It's really something to think about when you're, when you're not pursuing surgery, you're all, you're making a decision by doing that actually, because you're allowing your child to continue with the seizure activity. So please try to investigate it if you can. Yeah, that's so important that there's, there's something at stake, the waiting, you know, waiting can, you lose, you lose things when you wait too. So yeah, yeah, exploring your, all your options as soon as you can. Um, Oh, thanks. Sandra just said, this has been a lovely discussion. I hope it makes its way to many families to support them in their journey. Thank you for your dedication. And that's how I want to close. I want to say thank you to both of you. You guys are doing incredible work. Um, We're so grateful that um, both of you are in this space advocating and educating families and additional doctors. I mean, this is also a case of not just having to educate families about options, but a lot of clinicians do not bring it up. And I know uh, Monica is working really hard with a lot of different folks to um, Mm -hmm. make sure that this is something that... um, that clinicians are bringing up as an option and and counseling families, even if they can't do it, to say, hey, this is something to consider. So um, thank you for all the work you're doing. This has been an incredible discussion. And um, Monica, we will definitely link to some of the resources that um, you mentioned on here um, and some of those publications um, when when the webinar is up on the page. So I want to thank you all. We'll see both of you at AES. I know we're heading, all of us are heading to the American Epilepsy Society meeting in Nashville uh, to keep having these discussions um, and and continuing to advocate for families um, and for improved care for our children. So uh, that's our last webinar for this year. Um, So thank you everybody in the deep community and all of these incredible doctors and advocates who have come and um, work with us to provide these resources for families. We're really grateful to have you. Thank you, everyone. Take care. Thank you. Thank you for...